My gosh, you boys already know I'm not letting that Ramsey boy come over and play until you clean up your rooms. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and do you struggle with bad habits? Whether you want to drop the bad or start the good, today's guest has spent years studying how habits happen. Today, we welcome the author of The Power of Habit and the host of the How To Podcast, Charles Duig. Plus, Amazon wants to take over JCPenney and use the stores for what? Well, we'll break down Amazon's latest strategic move during our headline segment. And finally, we'll toss out the Haven lifeline to Brock, great name Brock, who wants to know whether he should pull money out of investments or take out student loans to pay for school. And then, of course, there's always my groundbreaking trivia. And now, two guys who need to drop their bad habit of sitting in a basement all day. Seriously, get out of here. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. The good news is when you're down here, you don't have to squint. The thing I don't like about going outside is I have to squint, OG. It's horrible. Did you ever use that phrase when you are in high school? I'm going to drop that like a bad habit. <laughs> I mean, girls said that to me all the time. Yes. No, I would just say, here I am, rock you like a hurricane. That's what I'd say. <laughs> and then they said, I'm going to drop you like a bad habit. Yeah. Hurricane man. Hey, everybody. Welcome to bad 80s and early 90s references for the win podcast. I'm Joe Saul. See how I average Joe money on Twitter across the card table from me. It's my friend OG kicking off the week, buddy. Speaking of nineties, I just did a nineties hip hop Peloton ride. Oh boy. If that doesn't bring you back. Is that fun? You know, one of the last spin classes I did before the gyms closed had on the soundtrack, the latest Bon Jovi song. And I thought, wasn't the latest Bon Jovi song like 1998? But no, they had a new song last year that that Just ran out of royalties or something. You had to do something new. <laughs> something goes, hey man, I got to make my house payment. Let's make like a Nicholas Cage. He bought like too many tigers, or what did he have? A volcano? Didn't he have a cannon in his house or something? That was that, that was, was that was uh, Johnny Depp had the cannon. John, so yeah, I can't keep foolish behavior personalities <laughs> to get straight. If you want to hear about foolish behavior, though. Head for The Stacker. That's our newsletter where not only will you find all the updates on things going on here in the basement, but you'll also find out money lessons uh, from a guy who had very, very foolish habits, guy who will go unnamed, but you will follow along and learn from his mistakes so you don't need to make your own. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash stacker for our newsletter. We got a great show today, OG. We got Charles Duhigg here. I think his book... The Power of Habit was on the New York Times bestseller list for, let me see if I get this. Oh, it says here forever. It was on forever. So there you go. Charles Duhigg coming down to the basement. But first, we have some interesting headlines. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. It's funny. I said new. Nobody saw me. OG, I say new in air quotes, but in songs, maybe. Year, year and a half old, but it's but it's really good. It's called Roller Coaster. Huh. Yeah. I used to think Bon Jovi was saying, Whoa, living on bread. <laughs> I remember my mom, we were driving one time. My mom goes, What did you think he said? <laughs> and so then she kept on making fun of me. She's like, I'll have a tomato <laughs> and a slice of bacon. Whoa, make me a BLT. Like, stop mm, it, mom. She's delicious. Like, He's like living on bread. You think that's the name of the song? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe he's struggling. He's living on some bread. My mom worked at a church rectory for our parish, and she worked for this great priest named Father George. And he walks into her office one day. This is back in the early 80s and says, you know, I shouldn't like this song because it's so bad, but I just can't help it. And she goes, what song is that? She, he goes, you know, that song from the movie Flashdance, take your pants down and make it happen. And she goes, well, good news, Father George, it's take your passion 
and make it happen. He's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I don't know what to think about that. He, like thought, a- he thought he... He thought he he was liking a naughty song and not quite the case. Hey, uh, our first headline. Why don't we get to some headlines while we're here? Wouldn't that be great? Please, let's do it. Our okay. first headline comes to us in the Wall Street Journal. It's written by Mark Hulbert. I swear, Mark Hulbert has some of the best financial writing out there. When day traders do well, it's probably just luck, Mark writes. There's little doubt day trading's mushroomed in popularity in recent months or that some day traders have produced extraordinary profits. According to statisticians, however, there's also little doubt that most of these day traders' good performance is due to luck. They essentially would have just as good a chance of success going to the casino. I'm not holding my breath that statistics will persuade any day trader that his or her profits were attributable to skill. But maybe going through the numbers will dissuade others from risking their livelihoods on bets that have little more odds of success than a coin flip. Statisticians over the years have devised a number of sophisticated tests for measuring the relative roles of luck and skill in the investment arena. Despite their different approaches, they come up with remarkably similar conclusions. And it goes through starting here with a bunch of different ways that, uh, that luck plays into all of these returns. And it's funny at our team meeting, the younger members of our team were talking about how all their friends, OG, all their friends have turned into day traders. And now when they're talking to friends, they're all talking about how they're doing the, they got themselves a Robin hood account and they're day trading the hell out of stuff. Good. Get people interested. More, more people interested in the market. This is seems very reminiscent of 20 years ago, doesn't it? It totally does. And you've got the market I'm going. in the news stories and stuff, yeah. When the market goes up, and this is the case, you see this even more in real estate, but when the market goes up, it creates all these, quote, winners who are, quote, I keep doing the, the, nobody could see me doing the little air quote thing, which I also find highly annoying, but they're brilliant, right? Because they made a bunch of money in an up market. Okay. Show me that in a down market. It is a tantamount to betting, especially when you're looking at it from the perspective of something like Robinhood, which is rewarding the behavior of, of easy, easy money. You know what I mean? It's, you can trade options, you can trade stocks, uh, you get terrible prices on them, by the way. So if you're going to do that stuff, you should do it with a normal broker. But, but then the highlight, especially with, with social media, you can see and highlight the people that have been wildly successful. I mean, let me tell you something. If I've told you this, hey, I bought Apple and that son of a gun thing went up. You know, you're proud of it. You're like, I did that. I bought 10 shares. Apple went up. Well, you know, 20%. Look how smart I am. But people are doing that with, you know, not four grand. They're doing it with 40 grand and 400 grand. And then that stuff gets publicized as this amazing outcome that just about anybody could do if they only had the, they only had the same tool that, that this person does. And look, by the way, it's free and you can get it. But just like at the casino, when you hear the stories of people that pull the slot machine and won a million bucks or you, I read a story the other day about a guy who was in uh, North Carolina. I don't know, maybe we talked about this, but um, there was a story about a guy in North Carolina that was looking at the lottery uh, scratch offs for the state and figured out that there was still a $5 million scratch off prize available in a game in a scratch off game that was pretty old. So he went around the state and bought all the tickets because he, he figured out that there was a, you know, it was there. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's pretty ingenious, actually. I mean, it's, it's takes some cojones to do that, but you know, okay, fine. So we did it. And I told my wife, I said, this is a great idea. We can blow 10 grand doing this. And she says, yeah, what if the person already got the ticket and lost it? Like, oh yeah, there's no guarantee. It's actually in there. Right. It's still a bet. Even if you've got all the math, right, it's still, you still could lose. And now he, it worked out. He bought whatever it was, $20,000 worth of scratch offs and found the $5 million winner, you know, or whatever the number was. But that story gets highlighted and people <laughs> like me go, oh, I could do that. Right. You, go the, you, you would see the guy at the casino that wins a hundred million dollars playing poker. And you're like, yeah, I could learn how to play poker. It's funny because as you're saying this at the bottom of the piece, 
Uh, Mark Hulbert writes that James Simon's medallion fund is a strategy that you can't look at and go, that was luck. It has increased since 1987, 2,091,747% versus a 1,886% increase for the Wilshire 5,000. So huge. Is, is he the brother-in-law of a guy named Shmurny Shmadoff? <laughs> no, no. But it's funny because Mark says that people point to this and go, this guy's a day trader and he is somebody who has done it. So it isn't always luck. And it's funny because... Yeah, that one guy did it. It's like going... Hey, I was watching golf the other day and that dude made a hole in one. I like to play golf. I probably have the same chances of making a hole in one. I'm going to go, you could throw a thousand golf balls with your seven iron off a tee box and not have any better chance of getting an ace than, than you did on the first golf ball. It has nothing to do with professionalism or strategy when you're an amateur. You well, know? Yeah. And Bradford Cornell an emeritus finance professor at UCLA uh, has done a lot of research into luck. And he says that, that this strategy, Mr. Simon's strategy is the exception that actually proves the rule for the rest of us. Professor Cornell argues that Mr. Simon's strategy isn't one you or I could replicate as individual day traders because it involves constantly opening and covering thousands of short-term positions. In fact, when you dig into the strategy, the fund reportedly is right in just barely more than 50% of the trades but because they're making so many trades and they're using the law of large numbers, which some dude sitting at his mom's computer in the back bedroom doesn't have the millions of dollars to make the thousands of trades a day to apply the law of large numbers yeah. to this barely winning strategy. Shouldn't do it, man. But you're right. Hey, if it creates people that go, you know what? I started off day trading. I messed up. Like how many times have we had people on the show that have told that story, right? Have said, you know what? This is, this is a story of most people, isn't it? I mean, not day trading, but perseverance through through some sort of yeah, thought major it, issue. Thought like, it was, hey, I did, did this with real estate and it blew up in my face. And then I figured out how to do it the right way, which is to set it and forget it. Our second headline comes to us from CNBC.com. Amazon, this is written by Ted Hasselton, Amazon reportedly discussing using former JCPenney and Sears stores as fulfillment centers. How about that? Amazon's in discussions with mall owner Simon Property Group about using some closed JCPenney and Sears stores for Amazon fulfillment centers, Wall Street Journal said on Sunday. For Amazon, more fulfillment centers near residential areas would speed up the crucial last mile delivery, the Wall Street Journal said. For Simon, turning over what was once prime mall space to fulfillment centers shows it be willing to relinquish an essential way of bringing in more mall traffic to secure a steady tenant. Uh, Simon Property Group declined to comment on the report. Amazon is a policy not commenting on rumors or speculation, according to an emailed statement. That last mile delivery becoming really important now for Amazon here. Oh, gee, but isn't this amazing? You look at the turning of the wheel, Sears and JCPenney back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, just stalwart companies. You get to the 90s as the mall starts to fade a little bit. And then with the growth of the internet in the early 2000s, Sears and JCPenney not able to keep up and now Amazon turning it into fulfillment centers. But remember how that was a thing in the late 90s, how the, the, the whole idea of the mall was going away? Sure. And it was 20 years ago. So talking about day trading, kind of linking these two, you can have the right idea. You can, you can be right, but just wrong. And, R and right be, too early, you mean? Yeah, you're right. If you said back in 1998, the internet is the future and never, never again will anybody go to the mall. First of all, I don't think that's going to happen. I think large department stores or something may eventually go away, but it's just too much of a draw. <laughs> like, where do you go to get, you know, movie popcorn? You got to go to the mall. Where do you go to get your iPhone fixed? You go to those kiosks in the mall. Duh. <laughs> what, what are they going to open stores like mobile stores? Come on. That's ridiculous. Come but, on. But anyways, if you had your investment thesis and you bet the farm on that strategy going, it's going to pay off. You know, you were broke long before. I mean, look at Target, for example. 
you know, just uh, last week announced they had like the best quarter ever. And they attributed it to not the stimulus checks. They attributed it to the fact that people didn't go anywhere. You know, mobile delivery up a ton and, and pick up and all that sort of stuff. So, so it's not that retail's going away. It's I w- some retail's going away. Well, yeah. And I would even say that while Amazon's had a meteoric rise, Target is more the company that you could focus your spotlight on. When you look at Sears and JCPenney, Target is probably what they needed to become. Yeah. Of the two, Target, Walmart, you know, those companies. Amazon might be might be a little different beast. Somebody said to me the other day, wouldn't it be cool, by the way, these Amazon fulfillment centers, if you could like go into them and just pick out your, like look through all the stuff and just pick it out. And then somebody else said, you mean like in a department store? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be fantastic if somebody took, you know, we have all these channels, OG, we've got Netflix, we've got Disney Plus, we've got uh, now the Peacock Network, Hulu, Amazon Prime, all these movie channels. Wouldn't it be cool if somebody just packaged them together? Wouldn't that be neat? Charge you 500 bucks for it. You could pay like one set fee and have them all. Be amazing. So our takeaways today, I think number one, day trading. Yes. (laughs) That might not be the takeaway. Day trading and luck. There's not a big difference between the two. Are there exceptions that rule? Absolutely. But in general, the exceptions prove the rule. And then number two, Amazon versus Sears and JCPenney. You got to roll with the times. I think it goes back to that uh, old phrase, OG, that Wayne Gretzky said. Everybody else is skating to where the puck is now. He's skating to where the puck is going. Anytime we can make a hockey reference in the in the show, I think that's Three a win. One. Yes, there it is. I think those are our takeaways. We'll have links to both of those stories on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Our guest here today is an award-winning journalist, author, and the host of Slate's brand new podcast, How To. His book, The Power of Habit, was a New York Times bestseller. I think it was on the New York Times bestseller list forever. That's a technical time frame? That is a technical time frame. He's also the author of another best-selling book, Smarter, Faster, Better. But today, he's not writing for the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, and other publications. He is here with us. Let's say hello to Charles Duhigg. And the host of the How To Podcast joins us, Charles Duhigg. How are you, man? Good. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm so glad you're here. And before we get into the podcast, I want to ask you a few questions about habits because... You may have written, you know, a moderately successful book on habits for people that can't see me, which is everybody. I'm I'm smiling and rolling my eyes because I think everybody knows about your book. But if you don't mind, this is such a weird time. And we're at this place, as you know, Charles, where our routines are broken. We don't get in the car for work. Maybe we don't dress the same. We might not even wake up at the same time. How are we breaking all these habits we've had our entire life so damn easy? Well, I think what's happening is that right now, and and we know that this happens, right? Like the easiest time to quit is when you're on vacation. And the reason why is because when you're on vacation, all of your normal cues and rewards change, right? And what we know about habits is that habits feel very strong, but they're actually very delicate. And that's because a habit is actually three things. There's a cue, which is like a trigger for an automatic behavior to start. And then the routine, which is the behavior itself, and then a reward. Every habit that you have in your life delivers a reward to you, whether you're aware of it or not. And during this time of being in the pandemic, like when we're on vacation, which is much more pleasant than it is right now, all of our cues and our rewards suddenly shift, right? Normally... We get a cup of coffee every morning on the way to work because we drive past that one coffee place and we love the donuts they have there. So we also get a donut and now we're not driving past the coffee place. And so all of a sudden that cue, that trigger in our brain that says, oh, you should be craving a donut and a coffee right now. It's not there. And so as a result, we're able to change our behaviors and create new habits very easily. Now, the question then becomes, 
what happens when we go back to work and our cue, our old cues and old rewards return? Can we keep these new better habits that we've cultivated in the meantime? Well, hopefully we have cultivated better habits. I don't know about you, but wearing sweatpants every day. I'm not sure that's a great habit. You know, I mean, I, the interesting thing is there's no such thing as like a bad habit and a good habit, right? There's just what we yeah. decide is bad and good. And certainly when you're at home, wearing sweatpants isn't bad. Now, again, at the office, it might not be quite as acceptable. But I think that the the principle is the same, which is, you know, about 40 to 45 percent of what we do every day is a habit. We know this from studies that have been conducted. And so for many of us, these habits happen almost outside of our consciousness without our permission. Once we begin to understand how habits work, we can recognize them. And that's when we can take control over choosing which ones we want to keep and getting rid of the ones we don't like. Yeah, you talk a lot in the book, uh, Charles, about stress and what stress does to habits. It seems like with a lot of us, I've been reading a lot lately about mental stress. Of course, you've written and talked about mental stress lately. It seems like that's been wreaking havoc on our habits as well. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that we know is that when we feel stressed, that it makes it harder for us to exert willpower. And so we're more likely to fall back on our automatic habits. Willpower should be thought of as like a muscle. It's, it's something like the muscle in your arm, right, which gets tired if you pick up thing after thing after thing, your muscle's going to get tired. Now, it can also get stronger and it can get weaker. But the point is that if I'm stressing you, it's harder for you to do physical exercise because your body is just tired. Your mind is the same way that when you're feeling stress, it tends to exhaust your capacities for willpower. And so as, as a result, we tend to let our habits run havoc over our life. And so what's really important is that during these times when we know that there's stress, right, people are worried about the pandemic, they're worried about having their kids at home, they're worried about what's going to the election. As we are stressed in this respect, we are much more likely to fall back on the habits that we haven't chosen. And just being forewarned of that actually puts us in a better situation because it means that if we pay a little bit more attention to our habits, then hopefully we can avoid falling into the traps that we might unconsciously otherwise. What's our first move then now with everything so different? If I'm trying to reestablish those, you talked earlier on about good habits. If I want to, to reestablish my habits successfully, where do I begin? Well, OK, so, you know, you'd mentioned my podcast. So I have this podcast named How To with Charles Duhigg. And a lot of the episodes are about exactly that. How do we create the right habit for the moment that we are living in or the problem that we're confronting? We did this one episode, for instance, um, called How to Lose 155 Pounds Happily. The way that the show works, it's same same format every time. We find experts in this area to come and give advice. And the, this woman had reached out to us and she said, I got gastric bypass surgery. I lost 155 pounds. And I thought as soon as I lost 155 pounds that I would be happy, right? This is what I've wanted my entire life, 155 pounds. She like lost the equivalent of like a whole other person in weight. And she said, and it happened and I'm still miserable and I don't understand why. And so we paired her with this woman, Brittany, from the movie Brittany Runs a Marathon, who had also lost a bunch of weight and had gone through something very similar. And she said, look, the key is here. You might have changed your body, but you haven't changed your mental and your emotional habits. And unless you start paying attention to those habits, those situations where you're engaging in, in self-talk, where you're saying, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve to be happy, unless you you change that, you're not going to change who you are, or how you feel. And that's been really, really powerful. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned that, Charles, because that was specifically an episode of how to I wanted to talk about. I, I was so surprised because I love the movie Brittany Runs a Marathon. So bringing her on to talk to this woman, Ashley, I thought was very powerful. Her name's Brittany O'Neill. And actually, if you don't mind, let's listen to a little clip of exactly the stuff that you're talking about directly from the show How To with Charles Duhigg. If you start thinking negative thoughts or, or feeling like what you've accomplished, whether that's getting healthy or anything else, isn't enough, take a second and ask yourself, whose eyes are you seeing yourself through? Are you adopting the perspective of strangers or, or old acquaintances on social media? In other words, are you judging yourself by other people's standards or your own? Because once you embrace your own standards, that's when you can make the choices that actually make you happy. How could I have let myself get to the point where everything that I'm working towards only has to do with what I look like physically? It, it really sort of awakened me to where I'm spending my energy instead. 
And so what has that led you to? I put a lot more energy into people I love, honestly. I put a lot of attention into friendships. I consider them as important as marriage. Professionally, I've started doing um, humanitarian and crisis response, making sure that part of my brain space and my energy and all that I have to give, which is a lot, is put towards helping other people, whether that's helping a friend who needs to feel seen and needs to feel like they're not alone, or helping a refugee find a new home and a new job. Figuring out and embracing women. It sounds like intentionality and serving a community are really keys for Ashley here, Charles. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what's interesting is think about the beginning of, of that clip where we're talking about whether you see yourself through other people's eyes or you see yourself through your own eyes, right? That's a habit. Nobody wakes up in the morning and they say like, look, you know what I want to do? I want to judge myself entirely based on what the meanest person on social media is going to say <laughs> right. about me. Nobody, right. nobody consciously decides that. That's just a habit you fall into. And you fall into it because you're checking social media, right? And that's your cue. And you become really curious about what other people are saying about you. And there is a reward that comes from seeing other people talk about you. It's it's sort of ego gratifying to know that like other people care about you, even if they're saying mean things. It's interesting. It's novel. You're attract. You're drawn to it. And so it's this habit of do I walk down the street and when I see my reflection in, in you know, the glass on the store that I'm passing, do I see myself through my eyes or do I habitually see myself through the eyes of the meanest person on social media who I read that morning? And of course, once we say it to you, you're like, of, of course, I know what to do now. I know what, which habit I want to cultivate. But until we point out to you what is going on, it's very, very hard to change. And that's kind of the point of the show, to be honest, of how to. The point of the podcast is to point out all these kind of obvious rules that are, aren't obvious until people point them out to you. But one of my favorite parts of podcasting aren't just what's obvious to to you, you know, as I'm on my run or my morning walk and I'm listening to how to. But I'm also interested, though, Charles, in what should be obvious to you as the podcast creator. And I'm wondering, as you're creating this episode, right, you're talking to both Ashley and Brittany. What surprised you in that whole conversation? In that conversation in particular, I mean, what surprised me was was how much simply talking to someone else who had walked the same path made a difference. So like what's interesting is like Ashley, the woman who lost 155 pounds, she's unhappy. And we paired her with Brittany O'Neill. Now, Brittany, Brittany literally is not an expert in anything except that she happened to lose a bunch of weight and they made a movie about it, right? She's not a psychologist. She hasn't studied this stuff. But she's nine months or 12 months ahead of where Ashley was. She just started losing weight earlier. Just getting that conversation going, just a chance for Ashley to say to Brittany, I am feeling this way. Did you feel that way too? Is this normal to feel this way? All of a sudden, all this knowledge emerges out of that. And this is the thing that we learn again and again and again. Sometimes for some questions, we need to find an actual expert. We had this other episode, a guy, it was called How to Stop Feeling Anxious All the Time. And it's this beautiful story of this guy who his daughter had passed away and he got into this routine where his wife would text him because she was his daughter was sick for for years and sometimes the daughter would fall down and hurt herself and she would the wife would text her husband and so now their daughter passed away but now whenever matt gets a text this anxiety just comes back immediately like he starts sweating sweating so much he has to change shirts he can become so distracted by the sound of a text that he can't concentrate in meetings he feels anxiety all the time has these panic attacks mm. and in a situation like that it's not enough to just find someone else who's been through something similar in that situation we we went we actually found as an expert a psychologist a clinical psychologist named Ben Michaelis who works with people with anxiety and Ben said look let me just give you some simple tips whenever you feel this panic coming on just stop and speak to yourself and say, this is a panic attack. It's a physical reaction. It does not represent that anything bad has happened. And then do this breathing exercise. And this changed everything for our caller, for Matt. Just learning how to do this breathing exercise made it so much easier for him to control his anxiety. I'd like but to put a shock absorber in there. That's exactly right. And that metaphor of the shock absorber is fantastic because oftentimes it's not only the breathing exercise, it's feeling like 
and control saying like, oh, now I'm putting in the shock absorber. Now I have a place for my panic to go that isn't going to you know, invade my brain and make me sweat through my shirt. And that's what we find again and again and again is that oftentimes just by voicing the things that are bothering us, by bringing it into the light of day, sometimes an expert just helps us say, here's how to reconceptualize it, whether they're an expert who's a psychologist like Ben Michaelis or whether they're an expert who developed their expertise just because they've been down this path before us, like Brittany O'Neill, having them help us reframe this in our mind, that makes all the difference. And that's why this, this podcast, How To, that's why I think it's actually powerful is because, again, you're listening to people tell their stories and then someone else saying, look, I understand you're stuck in this story. I understand this is bothering you. Let me tell you what's happening in a slightly different story and just learning that new story and gives you these rules about how to change what's going on. Speaking of stories, one story that a lot of people listening to this are familiar with is the story we tell ourselves inside our head about getting a promotion or getting a raise. And you just had a recent episode on that. I want to listen just to the very beginning of this recent episode, how to get that promotion you deserve. Well, it started the first time I ever negotiated for my own salary. I went in, in my power suit, I was really nervous. And I had a range in mind, and the offer came in slightly above. And I actually ended up calling a senior woman in my field. And I said, can I ask some advice? I'm not sure what to do. They came in above. And she said, I'm going to tell you what to do, Alex. You're going to go in and you're going to ask for more. Welcome to How To. I'm Charles. It's funny. I heard that. I heard my, and I could feel my own blood pressure go up as I imagine myself in her shoes <laughs> in this negotiation and going, are you kidding? I got a better offer than I thought, Charles, and I'm going to ask for even more. That sounds crazy. And the best part is she got it. She got more. In fact, she said that they expected her to ask for more, that she probably wouldn't would have been like uh, had less esteem at the company if she hadn't asked for more. And of course, in retrospect, again, this is kind of obvious, right? You're always supposed to ask for a little bit more. It doesn't matter if they offer you more than you think they were going to offer. You still ask for a little bit more. You always ask for the better deal if you're buying a car because you always just assume that the first offer isn't the best offer. And yet sometimes we have to be reminded of this, right? We have to have someone say to us, look, just go in and say, thank you so much. I was hoping for 3% more than you offered. <laughs> and it works. I absolutely love the width of topics that you cover on the show. And it's got to be fun creating it. I do want to ask you this. You're such a great writer. Why you in podcast at this point? Are you going after all that big podcasting money, Charles? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's more that there are definitely some kinds of stories that work in print, right? Where like the story is so compelling that actually you don't want to hear someone's voice telling it to you. You want to read it because you, I can write it in such a way that it's more interesting and it's more suspenseful and it's more compelling. But then there's other things where if you were to read someone say something, it would seem super duper boring. But when you hear them, when you listen to them say it, it's fascinating. I mean, at the end of the day, like what my job is, is my job is to take ideas and then find the stories that make those ideas absorbable and something that you can use in your life. And some of those stories deserve to be in print. And I love writing, but some of those stories deserve to be in audio. And so that's where the podcast comes from, is that it's this opportunity to find a new way to tell stories and stories that hopefully can change people's lives. Well, you might have a knack at it, my friend. I'm just saying, I don't know if I'm the first one to tell you this. You might be decent at finding stories. <laughs> it's It's been fun. I feel really lucky to get to do it, to get to, to, get to be paid to do it. It's How To with Charles Duhigg, and it's available everywhere, right? Wherever people are listening to this, they can uh, finish off Stacking Benjamins and listen to you next. Be sure to finish Stacking Benjamins. <laughs> Subscribe to that one first, and then and then type in How To with Charles Duhigg, or even just my name, Duhigg, well, and it'll come up. Hey, thanks a lot for spending a few minutes with us, Charles. I really enjoy your work, and uh, glad you could hang out with us and talk about How To. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm excited to tune in for further shows. Hey there, trivia fans. It's me, Mom's Neighbor Doug. You know, you're typically Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky Trivia host. Well, today, I just got to tell you a few things that really grind my gears. 
Did you know that Ukraine got its independence on this date in history from the USSR? And, and did you notice something? I didn't the Ukraine. People, there's no need to say the in front of Ukraine. We don't say, I'm going to eat some maple syrup in the Canada, or I'm going to eat some fish and chips in the England, or I'm going to go to the, the, the Walmart. Okay, well, some people do say that. And, and what about, I'm going to go see the pyramids in the Egypt. I bet you feel silly now, don't you? Now that I've set that straight, let's get to today's trivia. Maybe I'll chill out for a minute. No, I can't. I'm still mad about it. Since Ukraine, again, no the, got its independence today, what year did it get its independence? And here's a little clue from your pal Doug. The USSR collapsed the same year. I'll be back with your answer faster than you can end a Cold War. The thrill of the financial markets. Clicking the order on another day trading win. Introducing the perfect coffee for that perfect moment when you've just nailed an upside down candlestick all in move. Or that glorious time as the sun's coming up and you've pushed through the nighttime hours trading Tokyo, Hong Kong, Frankfurt and London exchanges and you just barely eked out that option harness that saved your ass before your 2450 call expired. What's the perfect coffee for that moment? Pour yourself some I got lucky again, brew. Imagine delicious trades and a fantastic taste. Sure, you might not sleep because that caffeine combines beautifully with your betting the farm lifestyle, but heck, it's nearly worth it because you found the perfect fix to keep you motoring staring at that monitor, waiting to squeeze out another quarter point on the VIX. Every time I push the button on another Wisdom Tree Coffee 3x daily leveraged out of the money option, I sip on my I got lucky again brew and think I got lucky again. I haven't gotten lucky in weeks, but I'm still up all night trading. Are you coming to bed? Be there in a couple hours, honey. That doesn't stop me from drinking a cup or three of I got lucky again coffee. Sure, coffee won't make you millions, but you'll feel like a million while you drink I got lucky again, brew. Available now. Hey, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I'm back. Wow, that, that rant felt good. It's, it's just, it's cathartic. I mean, it felt really good. So now that I thought up another thing that just gets me all worked up, why are South and Central American countries the only countries that get the honor of being pronounced with a native accent? Hey, uh, just going down to Mexico for some tamales. Yo, just going down to Chile for some chilies. Why is that? You don't ever hear, hey, I'm going over to Russia for some borscht, or, 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 or I'm going to visit Ukraina to celebrate their independence. Huh, never thought about that one before. I don't think so. Let's standardize the language, people. Elect me as your president, hashtag Doug2020, and we'll solve this whole crisis. Now that I set you straight again, let's get to today's trivia answer question was deep breath Doug okay question was since Ukraine got its independence today what year did it secure that independence hint USSR collapsed the same year if you guessed 1991 you'd be right Ukraine gained independence just a few short months before the entire Soviet Union collapsed in December of 1991 I think that's enough culture for you today. Don't want to overwhelm those little brain cells of yours too much. See ya! But you do say the basement. I'm going to the, the basement. So there you go. I'm going to the Taco Bell. Do you say, I'm going to the border. I'm running I'm to the border. To- 
I'm going to the McDonald's, the Pizza Hut. I'm running to the bathroom after going to the border. <laughs> Is that a bridge too far? I don't, I don't know. I think so. Yeah. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's most important questions. You know, our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they sat down and said, how do we do this life insurance thing better? Let's get rid of the long forms. Let's get rid of the overcomplicated application. Let's make prices affordable. And at the same time, let's have all policies issued by the parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160-year-old insurer. That streamlines the process so that you can spend time with the people you love doing the things you love instead of worrying about your life insurance. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life for more. And today we have a letter Doug brought in the mail. And I have a letter right here in my hand. OG. Oh, Oops. Hit the mic with it. A real letter. Yeah. How about that? Uh, from Brock. Brock says, hey, guys, my name is Brock and I'm a new stacker. I, I'll not uh, say his last name. Uh, he doesn't want to be associated with us just so he my can. Social security number is. <laughs> Did I plausibility? Did you see that uh, meme on the Internet? The people going. Okay, I'm a little bored. I usually don't play these games, but but just for fun, give me your name, mother's maiden name, birth date, social security number. Yeah, or we could no just different than the share no those in the, the things that come out and say like on on Facebook, like what's your favorite pet's name? What city like did you meet 10, your spouse 10, in? Thousand comments. Yeah, you're like, and I've got that piece of data now, and locked in. Uh, anyway, Brock says, my name's Brock. I'm a new stacker. Way to go, Brock. We should have a, uh, let's see if we got a. (laughs) (laughs) Got to go back to this one. I I hate it. We both have the pads now. Uh, I've been listening to the show now for about a month and a half, and I absolutely love it. I was wondering if I could get a little bit of financial advice. I'm currently a junior in college at the greatest university. Go Boilers. Okay. It's a leap calling it the greatest university, but settle for good. I know the boiler makers. Who's the boilers? I'm assuming the same. You're thinking it's still Purdue, but wouldn't you say like boiler up? I don't know. I'm familiar with the exact terminology, the appropriate terminology. Brock's, ask, uh, Br- Brock's confusing us here. I was curious as to what you would suggest about taking out student loans. I currently have about $3,500 invested in the stock market, but I'm low on funds to pay for college related expenses this upcoming year. I have the option to take out some student loans that are subsidized, meaning I won't need to pay interest on them until after I graduate. Should I go ahead and take those loans or do you think it'd be better to pull my investments now and use that money to help pay for my expenses? Any advice be greatly appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Brock. For the question, OG, does he leave that money invested and take out the subsidized student loan, let the government handle the interest for a while, or does he cash in? Man, this is a tough one. I'm kind of curious if the 3500 bucks would be enough to pay for school. I'm guessing probably not. I mean, I'm not so out of touch that I assume that 3500 bucks is, <laughs> is, is a college cost. But, he says, he but, says college-related uh, expenses, though. Yeah. I would say that if it's the end... Oh, he says he's a junior, right? Yes. And so if he could, if he can, yeah, I would pay cash for it. I would That's pay, the investments. I would totally pay cash for it too. Yeah, yeah, I would. Because, you know, I guess I'm thinking about this is, you know, for tuition, room and board, whatever, but college related expenses could be like, but every Thursday it's, uh, you know, quarter night at the bar. So I need a little money for my college related expenses. We had a friend, my wife and I had a friend in college who, whatever the number was that they would send you back on the financial aid form, like you're computer, you're, you can get this amount. She would take that amount. The whole thing. She didn't actually like, she didn't like do any calculations go, Oh, well I only need 11,000. I don't need 17. She would take the full amount. And then she'd be like, look, I've got $7,000 in my checking account, which would whittle its way down throughout the semester because that was just like a bucket of free money. Her spender brain yeah. was strong. Oh, uh, Yes, it was. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to hang on to this just in case I have an unforeseen lab coat expense. <laughs> it was like, you know, look, extra money. I can go to the mall. Yeah. You know, I I've been the there. Party. That was totally I'll me. Totally yeah, me. So if you can avoid that, I would avoid that, you know. Yeah, and then, I agree. And then use the downtime, 
you know, there's nothing wrong with being stressed and overworked in college, you know, get a job, go, go. I, I was going to say they, they're probably not punching tickets anymore at the basketball games. I mean, they're even having basketball games at Purdue anymore, but you know, I guess they're deciding on college basketball here in the next couple of months. So we'll see. We'll see. What you know, 3,500, that is an interesting number. There is that third, third option, which is, which is try to, uh, try to see if you can cover it. That's a great idea. I thought you were going to say like, no, I'm saying calls on Robin hood, <laughs> right? Keep your $3,500 invested, right? Cover calls on 3,500 bucks. Yeah. You'll get at least six bucks doing that. Not covered calls, like right naked calls. That's where the real money is. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Duh. And the good news is, is you won't have to worry about your liver later either. You'll be exactly. You'll you'll be shaken all the way through classes. I wouldn't take student loans for something not student related. If you just need spending money, that's coming out of your out of your investment account or your work. If you need tuition. That can also come out of your bank account, but I'd be more okay with student loans paying that. And I'm much more excited about that too, if I've done some ROI calculation. I think college isn't necessarily a straightforward ROI. There's a ton of stuff that you learn in college that can't be accounted for with a simple, here's how much money I'm going to make discussion. But student loans can. Going into debt, I think, is an ROI calculation. What's my return on investment going to be? And is it worth the cost of this debt mortgaging my future for that? I think if it's a $3,500 in the bank versus $3,500 in student loans, I'm not more mortgaging my future so that I can leave my $3,500 invested. Take the 3,500, get done with school as fast as you can and get out there and earn it back and get right. moving. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Brock. You got a question for us? You can write to us like Brock did with this here letter, or you can also use the Haven Lifeline, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If your computer has a built-in microphone or your phone obviously has a microphone, if you talk to people on the phone. If you got one of them new fancy phones that's got a microphone that, attached to it. That actually lets you talk? One of them. Yeah, one of them. You're good. Stackofbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. All right. That's going to do it for today. Big thanks to everybody for uh, hanging out with us again for another week. This is our last week, OG, of our summer session for Stacking Benjamins. And man, do we have a great week summer this session. week. That's funny. You know who we have on Wednesday? Lindsay Hartz, the fantastic fashion designer, Lindsay Hartz coming on the show, talking about her cool career, managing something as fickle as fashion design and how do you make decisions when you manage that type of, of company and that type of career. And then also surrounding yourself with good people, mentorship. Going to talk about a lot of stuff with Lindsay. Hey, uh, speaking of mentorship, if you're somebody who needs great help in your corner, guess what? OG and his team are taking on clients and it's your chance to finish the year on a big up note. It was funny. I saw a meme just today, OG, that said, <laughs> I'm thinking about going ahead right now and just putting up a tree and calling it a year. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Let's just set up that damn Christmas tree now and just get her over with. But if you want to finish your year on an up note, stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG. That's the interface to OG's team's calendar. You can get yourself on that and have a consultation with them to talk about how they can help your team be better in the future. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline. Be like Amazon. Broaden your thinking and you could find unexpected opportunities. Second, take a lesson from Charles Duhigg. The key to develop habits isn't through willpower, but rather by setting up processes and systems that set you up for success. But the big takeaway, hey, why don't we just drop the word the all the time? All time. That's better. Now to end the show. God, it's hard. Uh, end show. Wow. This is really hard. Yeah, that's a the too far. I'm not doing it. Special thanks to Charles Duhigg for coming down to the basement and reminding us we can conquer whatever life throws at us. 
You can find Charles and all his knowledge at charlesduhig.com. And you'll find his podcast, How To, with Charles Duhigg, wherever you're listening to us right here. We'll also have a link to his website and show on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. And thanks to all the fans who are voting hashtag Doug 2020. Together, we'll get rid of the the in language. No other candidates doing it. Join the movement, people. Yeah, and the thing is, this guy might jerk us around because he's not even ready. You know what I mean? He might just go, hey, uh, I want a bajillion dollars. The decision might be made for us, which is fine. Because the other house, the other house, the smaller house, the one that's realistic, that one we could easily do and just make it the beautiful little house we want to live in. Just a little, just like a tiny house. Comparatively. I was talking to my I was talking to my buddy in Seattle yesterday. They've lived in Seattle. They bought their house when they bought it. <clears throat> it was five hundred K and I thought it was crazy. I'm like, dude, you can't be spending five hundred thousand dollars for a house. He goes, I know, but what are you gonna do? We got what we got. Like it's a small little house and we're happy with it. Their neighbors just put something like four hundred thousand into it, into their house, which is a similar home. And just sold it for 1.4. And he's like, we got to do some improvements in my house. But the last, the last architect I talked to wanted a hundred grand just to, just as like a retainer. Like I'll take a hundred thousand dollars to start thinking about your house. You know, we'll apply that against. And he's like, I thought it would be like a $50,000 remodel. And they're like, oh no, think $400,000. Oh my God. And so he's like, screw that. But he just refied. And so he's down to like own three twenty on his house, but it's as is probably worth like eight fifty or nine hundred, like as a teardown. So he's like, I don't know, maybe I'll just go get a HELOC for three hundred grand. And he has like three decks. It's like kind of a tri level house. The basement isn't a full basement, so you kind of got to like watch your head when you're down there. But his neighbor basically took their house, which is the same thing, and jacked it up like two feet. And put in more supports and the basement became like a full basement at that point. Wow. Wow. And then he's got a deck that's off his kitchen. And then his bedroom is above that that has a deck that is even higher, you know, like it's even provider better view. I'm like, dude, man. I'm like, you guys have a really great spot. <laughs> you know, it's and it's in a small, you know, a little small community there in West Seattle. And the thing is, is that you either have to do it now or you just never do it. I'm like, you've already been there 12 years. You guys either commit to being there until your kid is 20 and do it the way that you want it so that you get tons of utility out of it and you sell the house in 20 years or you take that cash, you take the equity that you built up and go find a house in a community that you want to live in to like raise your kids in because they're in kindergarten now and, and two. So it's like either way, you're writing a check for, you know, 500 grand. It's yeah. either 500 grand you get to live in your neighborhood or it's 500 grand you're going to move to someplace else. Well, that's what Cheryl and I were talking about because we were going between these two houses and um, 
the upkeep on the first one I showed you, which I think of as the second one. So if I call it the second one on the new one, that one um, is going to be more. So lots of, lots of upkeep challenges. You know, we were talking about to do on that first house, everything we wanted to just get it done right away. You know, yeah. like you and I talked about the uh, upgrades we want in and be done with it. So it ends up coming out to be about the same, you know, like the cost at the beginning ends up being the same. The difference is I have a smaller house with all the upgrades right away. Yeah, it's done. The bigger, ho- the bigger house, I'd bite the bullet, but then we would totally cash flow it. <laughs> we would totally then do, peel that thing off a little bit at a time. Well, Partly just- because it's intimidating the f- load of stuff that needs to happen there. Yeah. Like the, just the amount of furniture I need for that house is going to be. Well, I was thinking about, I remember when you were in Texarkana before, I remember a conversation that we had where you're like, God, every f- time there's an extra grand, we got to spend it on this thing. Well, that's what, that's what I've been thinking about this morning since I woke up. Is I'm like, maybe the smaller one is just a better, because then, then it becomes a huge lifestyle decision. You know what I mean? Then you have a nice house, but you can focus everything on the rest of your life. That was the point that the Hills were making last night was that it really comes down to your priorities. Yeah. Like, do you want to live in this beautiful show palace house? It's going to be kick-ass if you host parties or fundraisers or whatever, like you'll be hosting that stuff all the time. Cause you can, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the house is totally made for that. If you don't do that, I think you're missing out cause you should do that. Yeah. Um, you'd be like the or, hermit crab that has the beautiful house on the Hill, so to speak, that nobody knows yeah. who lives there. <laughs> or on the other side, you get the house that low maintenance don't have to do much to, and you know, travel the world, you know, go make friends. You said that this house is across the street from the other one. Just make friends with the guy who buys that house across the street and then just hang out there all the time. That's all you got to do. Makes sense. Anyway, I think our strategy sound though, which is we made a low ball bid on the second guy to find out what the real comparison is. Cause we don't know what we're comparing yet. Right. Cause the guys even price the house. So once he prices the house based on us kind of giving him a shove here, we'll see what he, see what he comes back at. I was listening to a uh, podcast with Guy Raz yesterday where he's interviewing Dave Ramsey. And it seems to be a relatively new show that Guy Raz is doing. And, you know, you've heard the Dave Ramsey story a million times. You've heard the Trail of Tears and all that sort of stuff. Nevertheless, it's somewhat entertaining. But he did say something that I thought was really interesting as he was talking about debt and leverage. For this, it's kind of the first time that I've heard him say this. So, I just haven't listened to his stuff in a long time. So maybe he's been saying it a while, but he said, until you get to like 10 million bucks, the main driver of your financial future is your income. And I went, Oh yeah, duh. But he was meaning it in the context of that number is going to be somewhat quasi fixed based on your career. You know, we talk about like doing side hustles and that sort of thing, but nevertheless, it's like, okay, well that's, that's the number. And if all of that money is eaten up with payments, you have no ability to like do anything with like once you get past whatever uh, several millions of dollars, $10 million the number he used. Well, then the main driver of your wealth is the fact that you have $10 million and it just does its thing without interference from you basically, which also can make a ton of sense. That was kind of the first time that I'd heard him say, put that in into the perspective of the rationale of why you want to be debt free because the sexiness of the leverage of you know, but my interest rate's only 2.8%. So that's really awesome. You know, that sort of thing. It's like, but it's still two grand a month or it's still 2,500 a month or whatever, you know. Which is funny because that's the way that we evaluate stocks, right? Free cash flow. Yeah. He's evaluating humans the same way that we evaluate stocks. And the other argument that he had was based on just behavior and success rates. He's like, yeah, mathematically it makes a ton of sense. And this is when we talk about the know thyself, you know, it's like, Yeah, mathematically, it makes tons of sense to be ultra leveraged at a really low rate and margin the heck out of it. But no one's ever been successful doing that. So anyway, very interesting dilemma you have, sir. Good luck. 